My name is Paul. I am from Green Acres. Absolutely. I want to especially welcome some of my friends from my office. They came telling me they were going to uh, heckle me. I want you to know, though, that they're a bunch of realtors, and that should explain their behavior. <laughs> Before we get started, let's, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, and Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ears. Father, through the power of your indwelling spirit, would you give us the ability to understand what you want to say to us today? And Lord, I would just like to also pray for Christy and the kids. Pray that through the grace of God that you would continue to sustain them in the loss of their father and husband. We commit this time to you, Lord. Help us to be attentive in Jesus' name. Amen. If you don't mind, I feel so distant from you guys. I'm going to come down here. Um, not long after Carol and I moved to Spokane many years ago, I got a call from a friend of mine who lived here and uh, said he had a buddy visiting him from California and wanted to know if I would take him fishing. So early the next morning, we jump in the car and head out to my favorite lake back then, which was Sprague Lake, about 45 minutes west of town. Now, back then, it was before I learned how to fly fish, and so my favorite method of catching fish was drowning worms with a spin rod. And worms and salmon eggs were on the menu, so on the way down to the lake, this gentleman who, from California who fancied himself to be quite the expert fisherman was giving us all the finer details of how to catch fish in a stillwater lake using bait. He was older than we were, so we paid close attention to what he had to say. Didn't take long. We get down to the lake, launch the boat, get out to a spot where I figured we could catch some fish, and before I get the anchor tied off, these two guys already have their lines in the water. So I sit back, rig up my rod, lay it down up against the side of the boat, pull out a bar of ivory soap out of my tackle box, lean over the side of the boat and thoroughly wash my hands. Then I pick up my rod and start baiting my hook. First, I grab a small mini white marshmallow and I carefully put it around the bend of the hook, up over so it covers the eye of the hook. Then I pull a night crawler out of the tub, pinch the thing in half, and just hook on one very tip end so a lot of worm can wiggle in the water. Then I reach down and pick up a nice, fresh, red Potsky salmon egg and gently slide it over the point of the hook. After I have the smorgasbord all figured out on my hook, I hold it over out over the edge of the boat, reach into my tackle box, get my WD-40, shake it up real good, and I thoroughly spray the line and everything with WD-40 and throw it out into the water. Now, the reason I tell you all that detail is because on the way down, this gentleman from California asked me how I fished the lake. And I told him exactly what I just told you. He laughed. He thought that was so funny that I would buy into those old wives' tale and do that sort of nonsense. Literally, in less than 60 seconds, there's some short, sharp, sharp jerks on the end of my rod, and I hook a fish. Nice 17-inch rainbow, nice and thick. I take the hook out, let them slip back into the water. I thought this guy was going to jump in the water after the fish. He said, you don't do that where I come from. Those are keepers. And I said, you know, when that fish grows up and gets big, I'll keep them. <laughs> Literally, within 15 minutes, I had three fish in the boat. So I'm baiting up for the fourth time, and these two guys throw their lines exactly where I've been fishing. 
So I figure, what the heck, big lake, a lot of fish in this lake. I throw my line exactly where they had been fishing. In less than five minutes, I had my fourth fish in the net. As I'm slipping the fish back into the water, the gentleman from California quietly and meekly says, do you mind if I borrow your ivory soap and WD-40? <laughs> and I'm, I'm telling you, the words of Jesus in John 20, 29 came to my mind. You believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who believe and have not seen. That's exactly what went down. All the way down to Sprague Lake, I explained to this guy in clear detail how to catch big fish at Sprague Lake. He thought it was ridiculous. He didn't believe me. But when he saw me do it, he became an instant believer. Now, that's the concept I want us to consider this morning for a minute. What is it about your Christian life? What is it about your character and your behavior that compels belief in those who don't believe? You know, I am, I'm convinced that oftentimes folks don't buy into the Christian message, not because it's a complicated message, not because they don't understand it, but they see no compelling difference in your life and in mine as those who claim to be Christians. Now that takes us to my favorite all-time passage in Scripture. It's a passage in 2 Corinthians, so if you got your Bible, open it to 2 Corinthians. We'll get to it in a second. I want to look at three verses only. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12, 13, and 14. Now this is a prelude to a longer passage that goes from verse 12 in chapter 2 to verse 6 uh, of 2 Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul lays out the secret of his own ministry. He kind of pulls back the curtain and lets us see how he lived his own Christian life. And it's a compelling passage because in this passage, what the apostle tells us is how our lives, how we can live our lives in a way that compel belief in others. Now, oftentimes, I think too many of us put the apostles on pedestals as though somehow they were superheroes. There's no question that the 12 apostles dramatically changed the society of their day. They literally turned the world upside down. But I'm telling you, the same power that they had to accomplish what they accomplished is the power that you and I have today. They operated on the power of the indwelling Spirit of God, the same Holy Spirit that indwells you if you're a child of God and a believer in Jesus Christ. No difference. You have the same exact capability. Let me set up the passage for you because I think it's important that we understand the mindset of the apostle as he begins to write these words. The apostle Paul obviously writes 2 Corinthians, and he writes it to the Corinthian church. Paul established the church at Corinth on his second missionary journey. You don't have that slide up there, do you? Can we get a slide up? I don't know if you're going to be able to follow this or not. It's kind of far away. That's Paul's third missionary journey. He established the church at Corinth, which you can see it there on the left, on his second journey. Personally convinced, and this is my opinion now, so don't tell Ben this, but this is my opinion. I am personally convinced that in the apostles' mind, this church in Corinth was the quintessential effort in his entire apostolic ministry. This was the most important church that he ever established. And I believe Paul felt that for four reasons. The first reason is because of its geographical location. Corinth was a seaport town that connected the east with the west. All shipping, all commerce, all traffic, that was coming from the West, from Italy, from Rome, from Spain, came to Corinth. At Corinth, that seaport, all cargo was offloaded 
and portaged by slaves across the small isthmus there to Chinchuria. There it was loaded on ships headed to the east. Corinth connected the Adriatic on the west with the Aegean Sea on the east. And what it did is it saved weeks of sailing around the large man lass of Greece. Some of the most dangerous waters in the Mediterranean where many ships, many lives, and a lot of cargo had been lost. I believe the Apostle Paul took the Great Commission of Jesus seriously when Jesus said we were to take the gospel throughout the whole world. Corinth was the city to accomplish that purpose because all of the world, every society at one time or another came through Corinth. And if Paul could establish a thriving, vibrant uh, church in Corinth, it would go a long ways in accomplishing that mission. The second reason I think Paul thought this was such a strategic uh, ministry was because he spent more time in Corinth than he did in any other church during the first century, except for Ephesus. Now, he spent three years in Ephesus, and Ephesus was the capital of the Asian province, an important city, but it has had n not nearly the geographic significance of Corinth. In Corinth, from his own funds, the apostle rents the hall of Tyrannus so he can make tents five days a week and then teach in the Hall of Tyrannus every night after work five days a week. He didn't do that in any other city. The third reason why I think this is the quintessential ministry for the apostle is because he actually writes four letters to the Corinthian church. We'll see that in a second. Now only two of them remain to us today, but if you take your New Testament and simply pinch the two books of 1st and 2nd Corinthians, you'll quickly discover that that's a huge portion of our New Testament scripture. He spent more time writing letters and content and material to the church at Corinth than any other church that he established. And third, fourthly, he visits Corinth on three different occasions. No other church did he go back to three times. That's why I believe this is such an important ministry for the Apostle Paul. Now, <clears throat> that sort of sets up our passage. And what I'd like to do is turn to that passage in 2 Corinthians and just read the first two. Oh my gosh, look at there. Yeah, I know. Where'd it go? No, one of them fell out. I'm cross-eyed. Oh, this is going to, oh, I'm going to have to read like this. This is a wonderful. Where's Second Corinthians? <clears throat> I know it's there somewhere. All right, there we go. Whoa. I dropped that. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 12, this is amazing. Do you see it? All right, that's all right. Oh, yeah, that might work. Thanks, hon. She always says, don't bend them. That's my fat head, hon. I can't help but bend them. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now, when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ... And when a door was opened for me and the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. Now, when Paul started this third missionary journey, he starts from Antioch, Syria. He heads north and then immediately west overland. And first he comes to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus, on this third journey, is where he spent that three years. That was longer than he anticipated on being there. There were three reasons why Paul takes off on this third missionary journey. The first reason is to revisit some of the churches that he established on his first journey. That's one reason. The second, and a compelling reason, 
is to continue to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, which was his calling. But thirdly, and perhaps the most important reason for this journey, was to get back to Corinth and see what was happening. Because here's what went on after he established the church on that second journey. He leaves Corinth after two years and goes through Ephesus on the way home to Antioch. Now, he doesn't stay in Ephesus very long on that second journey. But about almost immediately in arriving in Ephesus, he learns that there's a problem of immorality going on in the church. So he writes his first letter to the church of Corinth. That letter is referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We do not have a copy of that letter to this day. We only know that it's a letter that dealt with this issue of immorality in Corinth. Shortly after that letter was sent, a group of people mentioned in 1 Corinthians 1.11 called Chloe's people, and what it was was a life group. That's exactly what it was, a small house, house church that met in Chloe's house. They come across the Aegean, to visit with Paul with some issues that the church at Corinth is struggling with. So Paul responds to those issues by writing a second letter. That's the book of 1 Corinthians that's in your Bible. And all you have to do is do a casual reading through 1 Corinthians, and you'll see issue after issue after issue that the apostle addresses there. Now, apparently, according to 2 Corinthians 13, after Paul sends that second letter, he takes a quick trip back to Corinth to see what's going on. Doesn't stay long, and then heads home again. And then he finds out, as he hits Ephesus again, that things in Corinth are really, really deteriorating. So, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, he writes what he calls a severe letter. It's a severe rebuke. It is lost to us today. We do not have that letter. But we know from what he says in 2 Corinthians that it was a very difficult letter for him to write. I wish we had that letter, because I'll bet you he tore into some of his closest friends for dropping a ball. But that letter's gone. We don't have it. Now, when he gets home, the turnaround time between the second and third missionary journey is extremely short. That second missionary journey took him a minimum of four, maybe five years. He gets home in the late fall of 52 AD, and then in the late spring, early summer of 53 AD, and about eight or nine months later, he heads out again on this third journey. And again, the three reasons, to visit some churches, to proclaim the gospel, and to get back to Corinth and see what's going on. He had had no communication from Corinth since that severe rebuke. Well, he gets into Ephesus on this third journey. He sees that he's going to be hung up there for a protracted period of time. So according to 2 Corinthians 7 and verse and chapter 12, he sends Titus, and the text says another brother, on ahead to Corinth. Now most scholars believe that the other brother is actually Luke, and I think there's evidence in the book of Acts that it is Luke. And he sends them directly west across the Aegean by ship to find out what was going in Corinth. Since Paul doesn't know how long he's going to be hung up in Ephesus, the plan was that Titus and Luke were to head north overland up to Philippi and across to Troas, and Paul and Silas would hook up with Titus and Luke in Troas. That was the plan. Now that's where this text comes in. It says in verse 12, When I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, And when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit. Not finding my brother, Titus, and I went on to Macedonia. When Titus was a no-show, Paul was blown away. Enough time had passed that Titus and Luke should have been waiting for him. What did it mean 
that Titus wasn't there. Had the church at Corinth completely collapsed? Had they been beaten and imprisoned like Paul had so many times? Worse yet, could they have been martyred? Now notice the text says that the Lord opened a door of opportunity for ministry. We don't know what that was, but it was obviously from the Lord an opportunity to do what Paul felt was his primary mission, and that was preach the gospel. But what's he do with that open opportunity? Well, the text tells us he had no rest in his spirit. So he walks away from a golden opportunity to do what he's intended to do. Well, he grabs a boat from Troas, sails over to Philippi, and as soon as he gets into Macedonia, he runs smack dab into Titus. That's recorded in 2 Corinthians 7. And we find there that they bring back um, an amazing report. Not only had the church in Corinth completely repented, but it was growing and healthy and active, and it was reaching the community and touching the world, and that it was doing everything Paul had prayed and dreamed and hoped that it would be doing. So in Macedonia, the Apostle Paul sits down to write his fourth letter to the church, which is the letter of 2 Corinthians that's sitting in your lap here this morning. Now, as he sits down to write this letter, and you're going to think I'm nuts, but I'll show you why I think that. I can hear the enemy whispering in his ear, saying to the apostle, you idiot, you bumbling jerk. Paul, God gave you a beautiful open door for ministry in Troas. But what did you do? You were so anxious. You were so uptight. You were so nervous. You were so concerned. Whatever happened to that, cast all your anxiety upon him. Nonsense that you've been preaching. You can't even practice what you preach. So what do you do? You walk away from a beautiful opportunity that's designed for what God has called you to do, and you head on. Why? Because you think Corinth can't get along without you. You think they need you. You don't even believe that God can take care of his own people. You don't trust God. You've got the biggest ego on the planet, Paul. How dumb. What a loser. I can hear the enemy saying that. And the reason I can hear that is because how verse 14 begins. It begins with a small three-letter conjunction, but... But, in the language, sets up a sharp contrast between two ideas. And the ideas that are clearly here is Paul walking away from an open door in the Lord and his perspective from God's point of view that he now writes. And he says in 2 Corinthians 2.14, But thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ and manifest through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Now, in that verse are three essential characteristics of Christian faith. We're only going to look at two. The first is that of unquenchable optimism, an always thankful spirit. You know, three times in the New Testament, we are commanded to be thankful in all things. In fact, the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, says it's God's will that you give thanks, not in some things, not in most things, not in the good things, but in everything. Is it humanly possible to be thankful in everything? When you're sitting in the doctor's office and the doctor comes in having reviewed your tests and says that you have terminal cancer and he doesn't believe you've got more than 12 months to live, can you be thankful? When you get a phone call that your loved one has been killed, can you be thankful? When you go to work on Monday morning and find out that the company is downsized and you've lost your job, is it possible to be thankful? I've sat in the doctor's office. I've had the doctor tell me that I had terminal cancer and didn't have 12 months to live. I stood behind my own son 
as he held his son in his arm, my grandson, and watched him die in his arms. I've been told you're fired, and with four small kids, had no idea where my next mortgage payment was coming from. I know what it's like to go through a knothole. And I'll tell you right now, the truth is, 99.7% of every thankful spirit in this room is thankful conditionally. You're thankful to a point. Drag you through a tight enough knot hole. Put enough pressure in your life, and your thankful spirit's going to go right out the window. Because the thankful spirit that the Apostle Paul is talking about here is humanly impossible to accomplish. You can't fake it. You can't drub it up. You can't dig down deep enough to find it. Because this thankful spirit that he's talking about is not rooted in your circumstances. It's rooted and grounded in your faith and commitment to God. It's rooted in the fact that you believe God loves you uniquely as an individual. That you believe that God will allow nothing to come into your human experience that he won't give you sufficient grace to deal with. It's because you believe that God causes all things, not some things, not most things, not a lot of things, but all things to work together for the good for those who love him and are called according to his spirit. Let me demonstrate that thankful spirit for you. I think the classic example of it is found in Acts 16. In Acts 16, we fall find Paul and Silas in a Philippian jail. It was on that second missionary journey, their first entry into Philippi, that was probably the worst thing that had happened to them. Philippi was a Roman colony. The apostles' general approach in a new city would be to go into the synagogue and make contact there. There was no synagogue in Philippi. They were all Romans. He flailed around for a couple of weeks trying to figure out what to do until he finally ran into a couple of women outside the city gate talking about the scriptures. Fortunately, he led a couple of those women to Christ, but during the whole time, there's this goofy, demon-possessed slave girl that was constantly harassing him and heckling him. And so out of frustration, the apostle turns and casts the demon out of the slave girl, and the slave girl also becomes a follower of Jesus. Well, having the demon cast out didn't make the master of the slave girl very happy, because he used her as a source of income. He goes to the city fathers in Philippi, gets the entire town in an uproar, so they arrest Paul and Silas, strip them naked, beat them savagely with rods, and throw them into the inner prison. Not the prison, but the inner prison. Dark, damp, smells like human excrement, puts them in stocks and bonds, blood running down their back, aching from head to foot, no possible way to get comfortable, not a good day at the office. A pretty tight flipping knot hole to be drugged through. Well, look at verse 25 of Acts 16. I still can't see. There is a verse 25 in there. Yeah, there it is. Verse 25 of Acts 16, but about midnight, midnight, hello, midnight, but about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I want you to notice the three participle verbs in that verse, praying, singing, and listening. Those are in the imperfect tense. What Paul is saying here is they didn't sing a hymn and say a prayer and then a good night, Jim Bob. They were continually praising, continually singing, continually thanking God, and the prisoners, I might add, were continually listening with their mouths agape, wondering where is this coming from, knowing what these guys have just suffered. But then look what happens in verse 26. 
and suddenly there came a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison house was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. Wow, pretty amazing. Do you see the miracle there? No, you don't. You really don't. The miracle isn't the earthquake. The miracle isn't the fact that the doors sprung open. The miracle has nothing to do with the fact that the chains fell off. The miracle in these two verses is that Paul and Silas were singing and praising and thanking God in the midst of the struggle. That's the miracle. Most of us will start praising and thanking and singing once the chains fall off, once the doors were open, once we were set free, but not these guys. Because their thankful spirit was rooted in their faith and not in their circumstances. Unquenchable optimism. The second, and we'll quit with this one, 2 Corinthians 2.14. He says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. Unvarying success. Is everything you put your hand to a success? It can be, should be. In fact, in the original language, in the Greek, the word always is put in a primary position, which puts emphasis on the word. What the Apostle Paul is saying is that thanks be to God, who in everything without exception, every time, constantly leads us in his triumph in Christ. Unvarying success. But note the three conditions in the text. It says he leads us. That means you got to be following him. You can't be out doing your own ditty. Secondly, it says it's his triumph. It may not look like a triumph to you. You may think it's a failure. But you've got to see it from God's point of view. And thirdly, he says, in Christ. That simply means that you're trusting in his resources and not trusting in your own skill and intelligence and experience and education, but you're trusting in him. Those three conditions, and success is inevitable. Let me illustrate that. The two years before I got into professional ministry, I did a two-year internship at Peninsula Bible Church in California. And I uh, interned under the college pastor, and we had a very dynamic ministry on Stanford's campus. And one afternoon, Dave Roper, that's the guy that I interned under, brilliant, has a, had his doctorate in seven Semitic languages, uh, knew the scriptures inside and out. He was just a beautiful man. He's still alive today. He got a call from a kid from the Theta Delta fraternity. And the kid asked if Dave and I would come and speak at the fraternity house. Now, that wasn't unusual. We had spoken at several of the fraternity houses, even some of the women's row houses. And uh, generally, on Stanford's campus, the fraternities, once a month on a Monday night, would invite in a guest speaker. So this kid invited us to come on in. So we did, and the, the protocol when you did that was you went in for dinner on Monday night, and then after dinner, uh, the, the uh, fraternity guys were dismissed to the chapter room where you did your ditty. So we're sitting there having dinner. Dinner's winding down, and at the end of the dinner, the fraternity president stands up and with his knife, clink, clink, clink on his glass, gets everyone's attention, and this is what he says, quote, I remember this as clear as a bell. This is Dave, and that's Paul sitting over there, and they're going to speak to you about God. If you're interested in God, head on down after dinner to the chapter room, and he sits down. I nearly choked on my peas. Something in my gut said, this ain't going to go well. After dinner, Dave and I went down. Following us was the kid that invited us, dragging under duress his roommate who didn't want to be there. We waited a couple of minutes. Another kid came in and sat in the middle of the room, and, and the chapter room was a beautiful, big room with overstuffed leather chairs and couches and stuff. Could seat about 60 people. So this kid plops in the middle on a big easy chair. 
And then pretty soon a fourth kid comes and leans up against the door jam at the door of the room. It was obvious that's the only people that were interested in God. So Dave says to me, time to get going. Well, the deal was I was to take the first three minutes and share my testimony, how I became a Christian. David was going to follow up with a 10-minute gospel presentation. Then there would be a question and answer period. Halfway through my testimony, literally, the guy standing at the door turns and walks away. I didn't think I could feel any lower, but I actually did feel a little lower. David only got about a third into what he had to say, and the guy in the middle of the room gets up and leaves. True. There's only this kid that invited us and his roommate under duress. Well, after the meeting, if that's what you can call it, Dave and I are walking across the parking lot of the Theta Delta house, and I don't think there were two men on the planet that were lower than we were. And just about the time we approached the car, a light bulb went on in my head. David had been trying to drill this passage into my heart and my mind. And it suddenly dawned on me. And I grabbed David by the arm and I stopped him. And I said, hey, David, did we manufacture this thing or did God set this thing up? And David said, oh, Brian Morgan. He's the one that called us. He's the kid from the fraternity house. And I said, so when we came to this thing, were we just doing this because we've done it before and trusting, or were we really depending on God to make this thing happen? He said, no, I think we've, we committed this thing to the Lord. I think we're trusting the Lord. And then I said, well, it seems to me then, David, what we just experienced was his triumph in Christ. It's just that those kids are too stupid to see it at this point. David laughed, and he says, you know, I think you're right. So we stood there in the dark next to the car and simply prayed and thanked God for the victory that he had had. A week later, Brian Morgan calls David at the office, higher than a kite. He had just led his roommate to Christ. David and I talked about it and thought, well, maybe that was the point of the whole thing. A week later, Brian calls back again and says, David, Several of the brothers are interested in a weekly Bible study in the fraternity house. Can you guys do that? That Bible study in the Theta Delta fraternity was the most dynamic study in the whole two years I entered at Stanford University. Out of that Bible study, Brian Morgan today is the teaching pastor at one of the largest churches in Cupertino, California. Steve Zeisler came out of that study he is the lead teaching pastor of Peninsula Bible Church, stepping into the shoes of Ray Stedman. Jack Crabtree came out of that church. He started a dynamic ministry in Eugene, Oregon. Three other men, after I started my first pastorate at South Hills Community Church in San Jose, three other men from that study came to me and interned for two years under me. Brian Morgan, after his internship, went to seminary for four years, and started a thriving church in Boise, Idaho that exists today. Bruce Mincer, after graduating from Stanford University, interned two years, went four years to seminary, and became the director of World Vision's Hunger Relief Program in Africa. Doug Hodell graduated from Stanford, did a two-year internship with me, went on to four years of seminary, and today is one of the most successful, dynamic Christian attorneys in Sacramento, California. Thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. A stupid little meeting at the Theta Delta house. Who would have thunk that would have accomplished all that? Just one brief story and I'm done. Thirteen years later, I'm in my second pastorate at Redlands Bible Church in Redlands, California. And I get this letter in the mail. And I look at it, and it's from... Wait a minute. Let me set this up first. One of the studies that I had at Stanford was a, a group of kids in Tresseter Union, the student union on campus. And uh, I had just finished the study one afternoon, and the kids dispersed to go to class and library and wherever they went. 
And I'm sitting there trying to collect my thoughts. And this kid slips into the booth across from me. I recognized him, didn't know his name, but I recognized him as one of the regular kids that came to our college Sunday ministry or Sunday school class. Now our Sunday school, college Sunday school class was too big to hold on campus, so we had talked the university into giving us the geology quad. The geology quad had a tiered lecture hall that sat 350 people. For two years, we packed that room to standing room only. And I recognized this kid as one of the kids who had come regularly. So we'd chit chat for a minute. And he says to me finally, hey, Paul, would you lead a Bible study in my fraternity? My heart sank. Everything in me screamed no. It's the last thing I wanted to do on a couple of different levels. One, I had far too much going on to pick up another study. And two, this kid was the classic stereotype geek brainiac that goes to Stanford. And his fraternity was the geek fraternity on campus. It was at the polar opposite of the Theta Delta house where all the jocks went. I didn't want to do it, and I was racing through my mind, how can I walk away from an open door in the Lord? And it finally dawned on me how to get out from under this graciously. So I said to him, I tell you what, I'm too busy, I really can't. But if you want to lead the Bible study yourself, I'll be more than happy to meet with you on a weekly basis, go over the passage, and then you can teach it to your fraternity brothers. I knew that would scare the bejeebers out of him, and he'd immediately turn it down. He thinks for about 30 seconds, and he says, when can we start? I thought I was going to throw up. I don't want to start. I don't want to have anything to do with this thing. Well, every Tuesday afternoon, from then to the end of the school year, I met with this kid, and he wanted to go through Colossians. Hello, Colossians! It's a brainiac book anyway. It's not an easy book to study. We slugged our way through. The kid was a brainiac. He loved it. Made no sense to me. What a waste of time that was. His Bible study in his fraternity house never got bigger than three kids. And mostly it was just him and his roommate. What a waste of time. I used to complain to David on a weekly basis how to dump this goofy commitment. David used to say, you make a commitment, buddy, you stick to it. Nobody was more delighted when the school year came to an end than I was. Kid left for home wherever home was, never spoke to him again, never heard from him again, gone. What a weight off. Wow, it was great. Sets up the letter. Thirteen years later, this shows up. It's from a Mike Pinkerton... Casey Industrial Sales, Olathe, Kansas. I've never heard of a Mike Pinkerton, never met a Mike Pinkerton. Casey Industrial Sales, I probably got overcharged for something on my credit card. And Olathe, Kansas? I have no idea where Olathe is. I don't even know where Kansas is. It's somewhere out there in the middle of the country. So I open the letter to read it. And this is what the letter says. Dear Paul, I have been wanting to track you down for a couple of years now, but didn't know quite where to begin. Then a couple of weeks ago, we had a guest speaker in our church from Peninsula Bible Church, and he was able to supply me with your address. My interest has now peaked. I wanted to write you to thank you for all the help and support you gave me during a very important time in my life. I think each one of us has a handful of people or less who have had a lasting impact on his life. You are one of those people in my life. I will never forget the time you spent with me in the student union at Stanford sharing insights into God's holy word teaching me and helping me prepare to lead the Bible study in my fraternity house. Even though I was raised in a Christian home, I was really still a babe in Christ. I had made an adult decision for Christ less than a year before we met. You are the one who helped lay the firm foundation for my faith. 
It's 13 years later now, and I am preparing to enter ministry in the fall next year. As I filled out the applications, one school asked me who had influenced my decision to enter the ministry. I believe that the Bible study I led in college and your coaching were my first steps on a path that led inevitably to the ministry. I praise God for the ministry you had at Stanford and thank him that he brought us together. I pray that the Lord has continued to bless your service to him. Take this letter and store it away. If you ever get discouraged or feel like your labor is not bearing fruit, pull it out and read it again. Remember, I am only one of many who have benefited from your commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you, yours in Christ, Mike Pinkerton. P.S. If you find time, drop me a note. It would mean a lot to me. Thanks be to God, who always leads us in his triumph in Christ. Father, we pray that you would give us a kind of faith that would trust you in everything. A faith that would be expressed by a thankful spirit. A faith that could perceive that your victory is in everything that we endeavor as we trust in you. God, burn this verse into our minds and into our hearts and change our lives because of it. In Jesus' name.